We're very pleased again to have with us Mr P.A. Yeomans, who has uh, consented to give us an interview more along uh, the lines of why his revolutionary um, water attention come uh, ecologically sound agricultural system has not been recognised more here in Australia. And as far as that goes, I think it's been recognised more by people overseas, by prominent people overseas, than here in Australia. And I'd just like you to read to, read to you a quotation by Dr. E. F. Schumacher, E. Fritz Schumacher, who I'm sure you will know was the author of a magnificent book called Small is Beautiful, and uh, more recently another book called A Guide for the Perplexed. Um, Dr. E. F. Schumacher has uh, said in his introduction to a book called Forest Farming, quote, but I was fascinated more by anything else with the work of Mr. P. A. Yeomans of Sydney, Australia, whose key line system seemed to me to possess the perfect beauty of truth, unquote. That's a quotation from one of the most recognised um, sane men on this planet, I'm sure, <laughs> Dr. E. F. Schumacher. And for, Mr. for Dr. Schumacher to praise Mr. P. A. Yeomans of here in Sydney, Australia so much, I think says something for our tragic neglect of his work in agriculture. Uh, Mr. Yeomans, there have been many politicians, agricultural scientists, CSIRO people, who've walked over your properties that you've developed along your principles, have marvelled at them, have gone away enthused, and yet your, your revolutionary system of, of key line farming has never achieved the recognition it so richly deserves here in Australia. Why do you think that is? I don't really know, but I suspect that because most research money is supplied by, well, you could say the opposition of Key Lion, uh, and people will do a lot of things, sometimes nasty things, in order to get research money, that, that might be a controlling factor. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, let's not beat about the bush. What exactly do you mean by this? Do you mean the large companies? Do you mean the people who, uh, shall we say, control the agricultural business at the moment? Yes, I mean the uh, chemical companies, the, 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 the people that produce the artificial fertilisers and the very damaging agricultural chemicals. Their influence is great. And I would say that is the uh, probably the reason. Mm. I remember uh, trying to contact Mr. Borthwick, who was actually Minister for Conservation here in Melbourne. Um, he actually saw over a few of your property, or a few key line properties in the Kiwa Valley, and he was very, very enthusiastic. And uh, he was reported in 1971, I think, as saying that you know he really thought that many people should come and look at this fine achievement. But um, it seems that you're more recognised overseas. Tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you've been um, consulted on. Uh, Phil, you had a question on the Vancouver conference. Uh, yes, PA. I'm wondering if you've got any comments about why it was that in Australia, in our newspapers, and our media, we never heard about your participation in Habitat 76 in Vancouver, I discovered it through a paper in the library about two years afterwards, um, what you said there and what the whole conference was about. And I'm wondering if there's not some truth in the maxim, you know, the prophet is never received or welcomed in his own home, if that syndrome has operated particularly in our society, our culture, I mean, it does seem to me fairly true that we do have a, an ocker knocker society of anything that's different. Um, I might have got any comments on, on this. Uh, at the Vancouver Habitat Conference, I did submit a paper with the sponsorship of the Murray League and uh, the Victorian Society for... Uh, uh, the name, some development society, anyhow. And uh, it was a very pleasurable sort of a thing to go to, in that uh, quite a few people came to the conference, especially to meet me, so that was pretty good. 
The what I said at the conference is recorded in a book, and uh, uh, some thousands of those have gone out to interested people in Australia. But why it wasn't mentioned in the media, I don't know. You've actually done a, a fairly big, uh, or been consultant to a very big um, area in Texas. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about that. Well, it arose. Uh, a lady rang from Texas on three o'clock one afternoon and said she just read my book, The Challenge of Landscape, and she wanted to come see our ranch. <laughs> so I said, "When are you coming?" and she said, well, we could come Saturday. <laughs> so uh, I said, right, we'll meet you at the uh, airport and take you up. So uh, the visit went off very well. We were going uh, going to the farm that weekend. So uh, a few months later, I had a letter from them asking would I come over and have a look at their property and tell them what to do about it. It was a 12,000 acre property in the panhandle of Texas and uh, they mentioned uh, an amount and uh, a couple of first class fares back and forth so it was too good an offer to refuse so we went. Mm. How long ago was this? This was in 1964. 1964. Has, uh, have you sort of kept in touch with that particular project? Do you know what's happened since then? I've had pictures of the uh, project as it developed. I think there were one or two of them in the Water for Every Farm that was published in 65 and then again in 68. And again, December mm. last year. Mm. But other than that, I haven't seen much about it. The lady that rang, uh, her husband has since died and she's married somebody else. But at the end of the job, the father said, uh, the father of the family asked me what I sh thought they should do. And I said, oh, well, Tom, who was one of the boys, should come out to Australia and have a look-see. And I said, oh, I couldn't do that. But by next morning, uh, the two boys and one of their wives had decided that they'd come anyhow so they came out to Sydney and they had a couple of days at the farm in a very very heavy flood period they actually sat the wife of one of the boys in the drain so they could take pictures of it <laughs> but the uh, <laughs> the whole thing was uh, went off very well with the rain we had to rescue them before the floods closed the bridges but Keyline works perfectly in heavy rain and they were able to see the whole thing in a day which it had taken them a fortnight to see only for the rain. This actually sounds pretty fascinating. Uh, in, in, in a period of flood like this, a gentle landscape uh, moulded along the Keyline plan it doesn't have massive quantities of water rushing down very narrow gullies and eroding the, the, the water away, does it? Now the water is under complete control and it's doing exactly what you designed it to do. And for the most part it's clean enough to drink. Mm. It's not even cloudy. Mm. But to get back to your original question regarding recognition, we did have visits from CSIRO. Early in the piece one of the things I had to do was to talked to 14 CSIRO scientists uh, and my background is mining more than farming of course but out of that Sir Ian Clooney's Ross took a great interest in it. Uh, later on after a couple of visits to the farm uh, we were able to photograph him with a handful of earthworms that uh, was published in one of the books I've forgotten which he uh, asked me would I do a key line project for them on 600 acres of land that they were just taking over somewhere out where they are situated now and uh, I said yes providing that uh, you do nothing about it other than key line you don't put any 
other methods in. It's just the K-Line show, you see, and that was agreeable. So uh, I went up and had one trip, but they wanted to know where to put a dam. So uh, I said, well, stop before said it's on the hill where we can see the property, you see, and I picked the dam site down. He said, well, that's the, exactly the same site that Waterworks picked out, but it took them three months to find it. <laughs> uh, however, he, he left on a world trip. He arrived back in Australia and rang me up, and I said, well, what's new in the agriculture? And he said, there's nothing as interesting in the world of agriculture as key line in Australia. And he died of a heart attack straight away. Afterwards, you know, within a couple of weeks of returning, I think it was, the next head of CSIRO was a physicist, I think, and and there the matter dropped. So that was the saddest day for Keyline, the death of three in Clooney's Ross. How long ago was this? Oh, uh, well, you'll be able to find his... When he died, it was just before then. I don't remember that time. Well, it was in the 60s, yeah. Perhaps, well, we can now look now, because, let's face it, we're in the middle of an energy crisis. We have finally discovered that the fossil fuel is not going to last forever. And I think one of the major attractions of Keyline, especially to, well, younger people perhaps, is that it doesn't use massive quantities of energy uh, in terms of the massive quantities of energy needed to make fertilizers, huge quantities of fuel for spray irrigation systems or anything like this. Do you think at long last the time has really come for recognition? Yes, I think it might be around, around about now, but a gentleman who was very astute read Keyline and had a look at Keyline uh, just before the first book was published in 1954 and he said oh yes Keyline is good there's no doubt about it it'll take 25 years before they'll even look at it you know and well the 25 years are up perhaps he's right mm. <laughs> was that Sir Cedric Stanton Hicks hmm? was that uh, Sir Cedric Stanton Hicks no it wasn't Hicks it was uh, I don't know who it was now but Stanton Hicks was so interested in the uh, in the soil making part of it that he when he heard about it from John Douglas who was the uh, rural broadcaster for the ABC in those days uh, he came up to the farm we only had 20 minutes we raced him up and back he had to catch a plane on and he wanted to study it and really sad, so he came back later and spent ten days on the thing. Mm. And uh... P.A., one thing I think we all appreciate is the effort uh, and work you've put into trying to gain recognition through conventional uh, government channels and through conventional scientific channels. Uh, the sum total of that work seems to be uh, totally exasperated. I was wondering whether you felt that in the future with people gaining a consciousness about the uh, impending energy crisis, uh, the shortage of materials, the need for changing lifestyles, whether you saw uh, a hope of recognition more at a grassroots level amongst individuals. I've really got no complaint about the lack of recognition because I, to me it was a very personal problem that I just got wrapped up in couldn't leave alone. Because it was spectacular, farmers used to worry the life out of me to go and look at their properties. And I wrote the first book so they wouldn't worry me, so they could read the darn thing and do it themselves. But no matter how I wrote or what I wrote, there was always this, where do we put the first peg? Hold my hand while I put the first peg in. So I'm not complaining about the lack of recognition. I think I've been recognised very, very well. Now, if you want it for the whole of the country and for the whole of Australia, well, I think that's good. And I think the times now are such that it could go. But I, I'm not an altruistic sort of a person. I'm probably pretty selfish. It was just a self-interest thing. 
instead of having an ocean going yacht and fishing or playing golf or going to the racehorses, I'd like to walk around the property and try and solve these blasted problems. Because I thought planting a farm must be easy. I'd plan mining jobs and construction jobs. That was the way to plan a farm, or so I thought. <laughs> but after years of, of uh, work and time on it, I had to look round and see what was right. And the only damn thing that was right was the, the fence that had been destroyed by a fire. We put it back in the right place. Everything else was wrong. But when the ideas came, the first idea which was the recognition of the critical factor of the shapes of the land, their contour geometries, the position of the key point, as I called it, in the little primary valleys. When it came, I had two sons at universities and of course were their mates, they used to like to spend a bit of time at the farm, and they tore the key line theories to pieces and reconstructed them and then accepted them and then planned the whole world key line and solved every problem that you could possibly have in the landscape. So these ideas all came in a matter of about three weekends with all the mistakes we'd made and of course that is one of the critical foundations of anything, the mistakes you've made. We learned not we learn what not to do, at a price too, until there was nothing left to do it but the right way. PA, I'm fascinated with what first turned you on to the key point, the key line. What situation were you in when you realised or saw? Where, how, what precipitated the idea? I think the genesis of ideas is a fascinating thing and it seems to me pertinent to what we're about here, the way you think and the way you were working as a mining engineer. Well, as I mentioned, I'd planned the works on mining job and then worked the plan and that had to be the way to plan a farm. But it wasn't, I couldn't find a starting place. I examined farms all over the place and I could see that they were all planned wrongly. I looked at what we'd done, and the only thing right was the fence, the outside boundary fence, and most farmers get that right. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I'd got a contour map. The uh, students of uh, Professor MacDonald Holmes used to come up to the farm as part of their business uh, about those years and uh, they produced a very, very good contour map and I was sure the answer was in that map. And if you could wear a map out by looking at it, I would have worn out 20 of them. And I didn't finally get the, uh, f the inspiration. I'd learned a lot about the soil, but I, I, was, uh, I wasn't satisfied with that there was any proper way to plan a farm. And then walking around with my eldest son one Sunday morning, the contour map was etched on the land with channels and things that we were using to get the water around, and I recognised this uh, formation at the head of a primary valley and then raced round on every primary valley on the farm. I named it the primary valley because there wasn't a name for it and I found that it was consistent and I went back to the map and found that it was cons consistent on the map and then I saw that every shape of land had a consistent geometry and uh, then I'd been playing with water in mining as well as on the farm and we had <laughs> dams and drains, most of them in the wrong place at that time. So uh, this key point concept, whether you've got a key line or not, this concept is the uh, basis of the planning. And it's the smallest feature of the land. Geographers don't have a name for it. They described some of my books as the nick point of a river. Well, it's got nothing to do with a river. It's only to do with the smallest shape of land, the smallest valley, which always falls from a ridge and always has a steep section and then a flatter section below so that was the key point and from that key point it was the key to everything else in the planning field. Mm.
It must have been tremendously exciting when you discovered this. And did you find that your enthusiasm and your realization and exuberance uh, wasn't able to be uh, passed on to others immediately? Did it take a while for others to realize it? Or did your family and friends and other people, colleagues, did they immediately realize and see the same thing once you pointed it out to them? Uh, I'll admit it was exciting. In fact, you don't know what excitement is <laughs> compared with the excitement that that was. But it, again, it was uh, a personal thing and rather a selfish thing, I suppose. Uh, my family were excited, particularly... Well, they were all excited about it and uh, thought it had to be named. We had to have a name for it, you see. And Key Line and Key Point came out of that. Uh, Did you really realise the significance of this discovery, though, uh, almost immediately? I'd done so many things that were wrong. Yeah. I had to recognise the right thing when I saw it, and this was right. right. Yeah. And within, a, within three weekends... Uh, we'd posed every possible land situation and problem to it. Right. And later years, I've posed every problem that I saw in other countries of the world, from the deserts of uh, America and Australia to the beautiful countryside of England and Germany and France. And there's just no other answer. So I had the facility then with a bit of background of geology and other things that related to mining work. I had the facility then developed very rapidly that I could sum up a landscape as I drove past it. Because yeah. everything that was on my property, and it was a little bit more difficult, difficult on my property than most others I've seen, it was there. It was the truth. Yeah. Yes. And I highly flattered to read Shoemaker stuff. I was very sad that I never met him. You never met him? Now, he was to come to Australia as the guest speaker for the Murray Valley League the year he died. Mm. Mm. We were very sad about that, but I never met him. Gosh. I didn't know that he'd read a book of mine. Gosh, that's remarkable. Tell me, do you know of anyone uh, overseas who has reached these same conclusions? Because really they are. They're, they're astounding in conclusions. Surely someone, somewhere else, has, has come to this sort of a conclusion? Well, a farmer said to me once, uh, you know, if I'd have had the time and I'd have kept on going and I'd have had a bit more money, he said, I'd have invented key line. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he's quite right, because if you spent the time, you must get to that point. Right. But isn't this true of all the best ideas, that as soon as we see them, we say but I should have thought of that, or that's well, obvious, we all should have thought of that. Why hasn't somebody thought of that before? I used to nearly kick myself around the paddock for not seeing ideas earlier that were there staring me in the face. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, what struck me after I first met you and Ken and subsequently read the Key Lion books that were available was the simplicity of it on one hand, and on the other hand, how complex it became when you built upon it and compounded it and put it from the macro to the micro scale, from you know, a quarter acre block or 10,000 acres, that on one hand it was simple, the concept was simple, and you could grasp it immediately, but the ramifications of it were far-reaching and were complex. And it occurs to me here that, as in the best forests and the best aspects of ecology, what appears to be simple and a beautiful pattern at first glance, when you look at it carefully, it's very complex in order to be stable. I believe you've summed it up pretty well there, but uh, it's, if we interpret nature, we can get the right ideas pretty quickly. But I didn't have the sense to do that in the first place. But when you examine the richest soil on the face of the earth, what's left of it, uh, it developed through the clovers and the grasses growing together. It was affected by the climate. And uh, I had a very, very good lesson on uh, the climate and soil aspects of this when I discussed, uh, had a discussion with Professor Albrecht at the 
University of Columbia in Pens in the University of Columbia in Missouri. As soon as he started to talk on a, to a totally different tack to mind, it, but it was related to the health of man and beast over a climatic zone from the east to the west across America. He even had the bones, the thigh bones of rabbits from the dry to the wet going both ways from the centre and uh, in where the rainfall was right that's between the 16 and 30 inch rainfall they were very healthy strong thigh bones as the rainfall got lower and very much higher uh, almost tissue paper thick very very thin tissue paper stuff uh, once he started talking, my objective was to keep him talking. And I kept him talking for three days. <laughs> and at the end of the, th uh, at the beginning of the fourth day, he said, well, I've been having a great time talking for three days. Now you talk. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how he got indoctrinated with Key Lion, and he was quite fascinated with it. <laughs> Uh, I suppose I talk today. <laughs> um, can, I, can I take you up on a point you've mentioned a couple of times, and it's something that's interested your son Ken and I, when we have had sessions where we've been working, developing, trying to fuse landscape and what you've taught Ken and Keyline, we worked a lot, then we had dreaming sessions in between when the rain was too heavy to work and that. And something that we've both had dreams of is how to make more available a lot of the marginal land in Australia which is be even outside the system that you first designed for outside those foothills you remember you described once the foothill area between the plains and the mountains um, that area what about the actual plains which are almost desert should we leave them alone or should we try to afforestate and de-desert well, if you remember, I called a chapter in the city forest, rainforest in the desert, wasn't it called? The desert rainforest or something yeah. like that. Uh, and it's quite practical. I saw a beautiful... I put in a channel once on a property out the back of Winton and uh, suggested that they don't do anything below the channel. This was to bring the water into a dam from a great umbrella of rocks miles away that if it were let go, the water would just disappear in the sands a little bit below the property. We brought that into a dam and I suggested they leave. They don't interfere with the land immediately below this transporting channel. It has the largest trees anywhere in the district, a beautiful belt of trees there, that are more like a, a rainforest tree than that. Actually, they measured the moisture of the soil and there was nice growing moisture down at 54 inches. And this is in a, in a country that, when I arrived, they'd just lost 5,000 of their last 6,000 sheep. And uh, what rainfall is that country? Yeah. Or 14 inches, but for 12 years it didn't average seven. And the year following, when the uh, the year of first year of key line was only 342 points. And yet, with this, the, the discovery there was to find this piece of rock that supplied the water which just disappeared in the, in the sands a bit further down, mm. and find a way of using that water. And, of course, the man was short of... Well, he was desperately short. He was about to walk off his property, and he thought, well, he could try yeoman's. And Uncle said, if the answer isn't there, with his... He gave him the challenge of landscape to read, so that dates it to about 1966, it actually was. But uh, well, that rock was the key to his whole property. And he was able to irrigate nine times, about 130 acres, in the next year.
from 342 points. The dam had filled with 60 points of rain on this great shelf of rock, miles away. Mm. We just trapped it and used it. So you actually and he's still on the property. That means he serviced his debt and has made money. And the only difficulty he had was when the, when the drought broke in 1973, he couldn't buy any more cattle to fatten. So he had a lean time for a year then building up a bit of stock. But while ever Dalgettys could deliver sheep or cattle to him that could stand up when they arrived on the property, he did very well. And he had an enormous debt to pay off, mm. about three times what the property was worth, I think. Mm. I'm going to ask a question here because I'm sure some of the listeners are not as uh, facile with the system as you. And if I've got it wrong, you can tell me and perhaps I'll be in the mouthpiece for the listeners then. Um, you use the rock as an impervious layer to shed the water into a channel, is that right? It, it was there all the time. Right, but no one had thought of using the rock as a sheet to catch the water, in other words. As, as, a matter of fact, the owner, as a matter of fact, the owner of the property didn't think of it that way. And I said to him, now, at the end of the first day I was there, it took quite a, lot, a while to look at the property. What's that line over there in the hills? He said, oh, that's the jump up over there in the distance. That's the jump up. I said, well, let's have a look at the jump up. And when we got up there, there's this huge rock area, completely impervious to water, and it was all had a gentle slope towards a break in the jump up and fed a little bit of a creek that you could walk across. Well then the problem was to find where we could take this water to a storage and he could irrigate from it. And, and the second problem was, not only the drought, but he didn't have any money so it had to cost nothing or nearly <laughs> nothing. Well he solved the problem. What did you use to build the channel? Bulldust. <laughs> That's all was there. His house was in the, a Dull clay... The oh, no, the Dullabore wasn't as bad as this in 66 when we were out there. The, the house, the only green around the house were three tamarisk trees and the spout and a homemade hot water system that was made of two green drums. <laughs> Otherwise it was a clay pan that probably three square miles of it. So you couldn't have anything that looked worse. So you dug a channel in the bulldust with a bulldozer. Mm -hmm. right. You could actually throw it up and then step on it and it would just flow away from your feet like water. Yeah. Right. And, and um, how long was the channel and how wide was it? Well, the water, came, uh, the water came into the creek, into the little washed creek, and travelled through the property for some miles and a few miles lower down just disappeared. We had to find a place to uh, back it out into a channel. We checked various levels and we found that we had no fall anywhere. If we we put a fall in it, we stayed in the creek, so I'd have to come out on a contour. But if you put it in one end, it'll flow out the other, despite what people say, that the contour won't run water, but it does. So the channel uh, had to fit in with a shape that would hold water cheaply. So it was only about a mile and a bit long then, although it came from several miles away, the actual channel we put in was only about a mile long. Right. Well, PA, I've had lots of um, people say to me that, oh, you'll never get that channel to grass, you know, uh, when talking about channel in clay or channel in sand or channel in soil, they'll say it won't grass, you know. Uh, I'm interested to know whether this channel you did in this rainfall grass and how long it took. Well, I have to admit that I don't know. I haven't seen it. I planned it and started the construction. Uh, in fact, I told him I'd go back and give him a day. If he'd get 
a few men and a bit of equipment round so we could break the back of the job. So we went back for one day and when I got there I was the tenth man to arrive and they had everything from shovels to little tractors, nothing any size, but we got the dam, I'd pegged the dam previously, we got the dam well underway and the lock pipe system in and I've only seen pictures of it. I know one of the channels was blessed by some archbishop and called the Yeoman's Channel <laughs> and, that, and that they had a, an opening day and that it became a stop on a pioneer tour and someone else had built a motel somewhere near it so they could get at it, but I haven't seen it since. Only pictures.